Um, well, where do I start? Um, first, it's been a pleasure to, for us as the Internet Society to be here again at Mo IP. It's my first Mo IP event, and I'm quite pleased by the turnout, um, the opportunity to meet lots of folks. And I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate um, Six for 30 years anniversary. I think that's great. Welcome to the club. We turned 32 at the Internet Society, so we are getting the experience of being in the 30s, what that means. And I also really like the presentations earlier today, which are talking about looking at the future, because as you get to 30s, you start asking the same question, what does the future look like? And so today, I have a presentation moving towards an interconnected Africa because it's also looking at the future of Africa. What does that mean? What are the trends and opportunities um, that we see? I will give this presentation using the lens of the Internet Society and the work that we've done in Africa for the last 16 or so years. When we started um, around 2008, uh, which is when I joined the Internet Society, tells you how long I've been there, um, we did a survey to try and understand the interconnection landscape. And there wasn't much. Connectivity was largely through satellite. There was three main submarine cables. We tried to reach out to the number of internet exchange points that were there. We knew about 17 of them. 12 responded to my emails, so I don't know about the rest. We later came to discover they were not the operational. And there wasn't a lot of traffic being exchanged across those exchange points at that point in time. And a bunch of other stuff. Total aggregate traffic was about 360 megabits per second across the entire continent. Not much. So we took time to try and understand what can we do then to change that landscape. And we tried to understand where the challenge is, what are the opportunities, they're simply a uh, waste of time, uh, SWOT that was mentioned earlier. Uh, what is it that we could actually do? And we understood that we needed to undertake a process to get to a point where there's traffic growth across all those markets. And first, what we needed to ad address is the issue of market reform, which we hoped then would unlock the issue of long distance backhaul connectivity that is needed. We also did realize at some point that we needed to address the issue of content regulation so that infrastructure, data centers, uh, local content could be developed in those markets. And there was a role for IXPs to play in actually developing the new networks or developing the capacity of networks to be able to connect to the internet exchange points, exchange traffic, so capacity building, bringing new networks online, um, and so on, that needed to happen because not just the traditional networks were going to bring that growth that was expected. And as a result, they would, would help uh, end up having an ecosystem of growth across the region. So that was the vision, like build an ecosystem across the continent. So we got to do that, we started with that, and I have to say, we didn't do it alone. We had partners. Am6, um, Job, um, Hank were key folks who came in and supported the work we were doing, uh, going all the way back from 2009 to 2010, PCH, Cisco, Google, and many others have been part of that journey. And that involved giving equipment donation. Developing that community was key. So it's not just building infrastructure, but building that community. Why? Because that community is essential in going to do work that we cannot do as an organization. They have the reach at the national level. They have the ability to engage with policymakers, stakeholders, to grow the local ecosystem. And we also had the role to engage policymakers at a higher level, like at the African Union, to get them to see what opportunities they needed to unlock. And that engagement at the local level, sub-regional level, at the continental level, was key to triggering certain growth. And we do see that growth. 
first was policy reform that was needed. Now, if you look at the ITU data today, it shows just about 10% of the countries in Africa are still very close markets that are not open. Majority of them are in the trend of opening or having opened up. We are seeing a number of policy, um, continental-wide policy agreements that are being signed and adopted at the national level. Um, for instance, the Pan-African Payment and Settlement Systems that actually allows people across the continent to send money and exchange money across the continent. We've seen the Africa Continental Tr uh, Free Trade Agreement, or AFCTA, which is allowing organizations to trade across the continent freely, without a lot of barriers. Uh, the digital single market um, that is being uh, touted, which is under the African Union 2030 strategy, uh, 2050 strategy, sorry, um, is it 2050 or 2030? 2030 strategy, which allows to open for more um, a single digital economy across the continent. Again, all of this are key. Why are they key? When they set the pace, folks tend to follow. Businesses will follow. Innovation around supporting those policies that have been adopted tend to follow. Without the policy, we don't see action. And so it has been important to pursue them. We've had the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. Again, an important part, uh, um, an important policy document that is now being ratified uh, by a number of countries. And all of these are moving the continent forward from a policy perspective, because as I said before, without the policy, then you don't see this progression in investment. You don't see this uh, movement, uh, whether it's investment, capacity building, or any action that needs to happen to move the continent forward. So we are seeing some changes. We have some countries that are moving forward early, um, fast. South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, those ones are sort of uh, moving forward. And with that happening at the same time, in parallel, the investments, the time, the effort that has been made by various stakeholders to build that infrastructure, especially on the connectivity side, has also been paying off. Moving from less than 20% of the countries having an internet exchange point, now nearly 70% of the countries in Africa have an internet exchange point. In fact, some countries have more than one. So that's great. Another thing that has happened is there's been a lot of investment in submarine cables. A lot of investment now going on on terrestrial fiber and data centers. It's not where it needs to be. I, I want to make this clear. It's not where it needs to be for a continent of a billion people. But that doesn't mean that it's bad. We're using this opportunity to just take a look at what has happened last 14, 16 years. A lot of these developments have actually just taken place in the last 10. So it's a great picture. I like looking at this because it shows, if you looked at my first one and you look at this, then it feels like, oh wow, you know, there's something happening. And Part of that conversation then should be translating into something we see. What are we seeing from a conversation of, is Africa more interconnected? Is it getting more interconnected? Are we seeing conversations around keeping traffic in the continent, exchanging traffic within the continent? And if you looked at uh, keenly at my slides when I talked about the milestones, in 2015, we started a vision, um, a campaign rather, 8020 by 2020, which was to promote the amount of local content accessible within the region uh, to be at 80%, and only 20% is pulled from outside the region. It wasn't successful, but this is 2016, according to telegeography. This is 2019, according to telegeography. That's 2021, 
as per telegeography. And that's 2023. There was movement, there was traction, the message was getting there. And networks and the community was responding to the call around a more interconnected continent. Now, recently, for some of you who've been watching the news, there was a disconnection, uh, the two cables that were disconnected in the East African coast, round about here, Mozambique. The countries who noticed that significant degradation of connectivity are not these countries, are countries in the East, because a lot of the data that they consume comes from Southern Africa. So that's the impact of more interconnection, in that there's a lot of interdependency. So it means we need to do more in building that resiliency of the internet connection across the continent. So where do we see opportunities? At the Internet Society, we have been building this platform called Pulse, which we use to measure the uh, global health and availability of the Internet. And one tool we have is called the Internet Resiliency Index. And our measure for a better Internet is a resilient Internet, which means a resilient Internet is one that's able to deliver acceptable level of service when it faces um, challenges to normal operations or just you know, significant challenges uh, to operations. So we've tried to get some data points, uh, metrics around the infrastructure, um, performance, market readiness, which looks at the uh, how well the market is from uh, being able to access affordable connectivity and also security of the internet infrastructure. Now, Africa, cumulatively, if you look at those measures, we have about 25 indexes, indices or data points that we look at. Um, I, if you aggregate that, it's around 35%. Uh, the internet resilience across the continent is around 35%. And then when you take apart the region and sort of look, it, look at it across the different regions where we have, you will see that Southern Africa is a lot more mature. So the previous data um, that shows that there's a lot of connectivity, content residing in the region is supported by this uh, measure that we have of, um, if you look at Southern Africa, more interconnection, more infrastructure, data centers, and so on. Eastern Africa comes close to second. Um, then you have uh, Northern Africa, or Western Africa, and Central Africa, which needs a lot more work. So Western, Central Africa need, do, do need a lot more work. But there's another conversation that we also need to look at when we look forward. According to the ITU, 2.6 billion people are not connected. They live mostly in underserved uh, emerging markets. And according to their 2023 data, um, one in 100 people in low-income countries have a fixed broadband connectivity. And yes, that's what, where the most uh, data consumption comes from. It means that if we're looking about solving or uh, having a better society, enabling innovation which needs to happen through the internet, to provide people fixed connectivity is going to be something we need to think about. And it also means that the traditional ways we've used to connect people are less likely going to work. So we have to ask ourselves, what does good look like in the future? That's the question. What does good look like in the future? Let's use another data point to be able to try and understand this. 
according to Afrinic, there are only about 2,500 autonomous system numbers, and less than 50% of those are given to ISPs, or networks that provide access. So, are these networks capable of connecting the remaining more than 50%, because Africa is around 43% of uh, users online? Will the models that we have today be able to bring those people that are yet to be connected online? I've given you the example of what happened recently with the submarine cable cuts on the east. Before that, there was a submarine cable cut on the west. And before that, there was a submarine cable cut in the north, just about Yemen. There, hasn't, there has been a lot of investment in submarine cables, but very little investment in the terrestrial infrastructure across the continent. So in fact, for a lot of the countries sea-facing countries in Africa, the way we communicate to neighboring countries is through the submarine cables, not through terrestrial infrastructure. The only terrestrial infrastructure that is used largely is for landlocked countries. So it makes it very expensive because there's just a limited number of cables that have actually crossed borders to landlocked countries. So it makes it expensive. So what are the lessons we can draw from countries that have actually managed to make the borders disappear? One example I normally use that... Where is it, Kenna? I'll go after you, my brother from Nigeria. Um, the capital city of Nigeria is in Lagos. I mean, sorry, Abuja. My, my bad. Abuja. From Abuja to London and Lagos to London, it is more expensive to buy capacity from Abuja, which is north of Lagos, to Abuja, I mean, to Lagos. Ab Abuja to Lagos is more expensive than Lagos to London. Right? That shouldn't be the case. So we need to make investments in there. We need to change that. Um, trajectory. There is also the next phase of that conversation, so once we address the terrestrial infrastructure, because policy is changing, infrastructure is changing, but only a submarine, we need to go to terrestrial, then we also need to go to the next part, which is the content. I call this the layered challenge because it's almost like peeling an onion ring, um, an onion. Every time you deal with something, then you learn something else needs to happen. Uh, you have internet exchange points. Yes, okay, that's not all countries have. Okay, let's get our XPs to all countries. Well, not all of them are growing. Okay, why are they not growing? There is no terrestrial infrastructure or there are not enough uh, operators in the country. Oh, uh, we need to develop the technical clue uh, that exist in that country. Oh, we need to um, address another issue of digitization. Oh, but how do you monetize uh, the content and so on and so forth. So it sort of like becomes um, a chicken and egg situation where it's not very clear where you need to start. But we do need to ask this question and we do need to start somewhere. What does 2030 look like? That was the question I asked. What does good look like? Sorry, what does good look like? So we'll set a timeline in 2030, so five years from now. Some organizations, um, ITU, UN, and others are currently discussing that. And there's a conversation that in 2030, for people everywhere, the cost of the internet should be about 2% of the gross national income per capita. Now, if you look at data today, most of Africa is above 10%. The cost of broadband connectivity, fixed broadband connectivity, is more than 10% of the gross national income per capita. So what are we going to do to contribute to bringing this down? That's a question I want to leave you with because I can't give all the answers. But part of why we're here, we'd like to have that conversation with you and say, 
how can we partner? Because we believe as the internet society, we cannot solely do all of, achieve, make that huge change or impact alone. And we want to work with everyone in this room as partners, because we believe that people everywhere should have access to affordable, reliable, and resilient internet. We are working with partners, and I'm happy that AM6 is joining us to sort of work on that partnership to bring more affordable and resilient internet to people in Africa, looking at West Africa. We have others like Meta and so on who've been supporting this kind of work. So if you're interested and you're keen to have this kind of impact, and I've shown what we've been able to accomplish over that period of time, please reach out to us. I'm here with my colleagues, Olaf Kalkman here, and Sally, where is Sally? Oh, at the back there. We're happy to chat. We understand the market in Africa really well. Uh, we've built internet exchange points, we've built connectivity, we've talked about policy. And we're very keen because we do have a strategic approach. Our approach is very key that we start at the sub-regional and the national level, where we actually engage to make sure that they have access to resilient infrastructure, because resilience means you can actually dependably use that connectivity. And then we go to the local level and look at an innovative approach on how to bring those people who don't have access to get connectivity. And we have a lot of experience in changing and looking at a, a different approach to bringing connectivity to those who are not connected. So with that, I'd like to stop there. Thank you very much. So happy to take questions, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, if it's okay, let me just kick off with one. Sure. Just, I'm super curious. Like, what what can account for the the the, the kind of meteoric progress over the last decade? Why did why did things suddenly accelerate? Um, actually, in that period, we've had the highest number of uh, policy changes across many countries. Um, there was, if you think across most. If you looked at the map, the, the ITU graph in, two, in 2008 to 2012, mostly red. Mm. And then after that, when the changes happened, it's when it became now uh, quite easy to encourage people to make investments. Right. So there are a lot of governments that were more open to attracting. So I'll give an example. I, came, I come from Kenya, where a government went and said, oh, we don't have submarine cable. Uh, connecting East Africa, so why, why don't we build a special purpose vehicle to bring connectivity? And that was the Teams cable. And the moment that went in, private sector was like, oh, we could actually play ball here. And so Seacom was uh, the next cable that started uh, being built around 2008, 2009. Um, so by 2010, we start seeing cables getting built, those consortium investments from uh, uh, in West Africa and the wax cable, the telecom operators started coming together to build, uh, make investments, strategic investments into submarine cables. And then now that started transitioning to terrestrial because the question was, uh, we used to make fun of this, the only way to get from Cape Town to Cairo was through wet packets, packets that pass underwater. Can we do that through dry packets, which are passing through. And I remember uh, a, a good friend and um, CTO, at, uh, Ben Roberts, who probably some of you know from Liquid, say, we're going to be the first ones to go from Cape Town to Cairo terrestrially. And they announced that at, at the peering forum uh, in Cape Town. And a few years later, they had actually done it. They had built terrestrial infrastructure. So bringing that community, I think, was the key thing that the community had spaces where they could open up and talk about the challenges and how to tackle those challenges, and then go out and um, you know, meet, discuss what the opportunities are, then go out and do something. And as we've tracked the 10 years, uh, the 14 years of, let's say, for instance, AFPIF, which is, will be 14 years this year, all of them come back and say that meeting helped them do important um, sort of transformational change or investments that have opened up the region. Wow. So um, 
you know, AFPIF is sort of like a slightly more regional, more IP event or a peering event, if you will, uh, like the European Peering Forum. But they have been meeting there consistently for more than a decade. Yeah. So they know each other, they've brought in new people, and that community for us remains one of the most important investments that we've made as an organization in nurturing a community to create and innovate about their future and mm -hmm. sort of, um, you know. So I think the, the message is that there are opportunities out there yes. and when you see, w w when there are um, new developments like Africa, go, go, go by all means, uh, go to Kenya, talk to people and, uh, and then you never know what, what's going to come out at the end of it. Yes, and I think to the question that was being asked earlier around, you know, what does the future look like? I think trying to imagine the future alone is limiting. Mm. You want to imagine the future with everyone you're with. You know, there's always this old adage that if you want to go uh, faster, go alone, and if you want to go farther, go together, right? Um, so it's the same thing. That's the vision we have where we have to bring everybody into the same room and say, where do we want to go? So we have to go, if we want to go farther, then we have to go together. Yeah. And uh, that's the collective approach of community that helps us build an even bigger vision than one we have. Okay. Yeah. Chuki, we have to leave it there, but that's a great note to end on, a battle cry for, for widening, broadening the community even more. Yeah. So thank you very much. Chuki Mwangi, everyone. Thank you.